After doing a live on this subject, it gets really interesting to do the long patrol a week later. And when I say a week later, I mean... I've recorded this about three times. And I'm now doing it a fourth time. And each time I go back, I watch the video, I read the comments underneath the live, and I sort of go, right, what gaps did I leave that I really should have covered? What things did I include that I had mentally already prepared for the recorded video? So maybe I don't need to cover in quite the same detail. And what bits did I not include that I really would like to see included and which seem to be responding to the, co to the comments. And this was one of those videos where I wasn't really expecting it to do well at all. It is a bit of a niche subject and honestly it's been over a week and it's had less than a thousand views so I'm not really surprised. The USS Akron, I find it really cool and interesting but most people once you start to go, well the world's first purpose-built flying aircraft carrier and the fact there are only two of these really built at her and her sister and that's it sort of tells you what you need to know about the difficulties of operating a flying aircraft carrying its realities but still I'm glad I did it and I think it's one of those subjects which is worthwhile exploring more. The Akron represents, in many ways, a moment in time. A uh, period when they were thinking about what the reality of global reach and global effect would be. It's when America is trying to think of an American way of going global. And I often think sometimes some of the post-World War II and Cold War rewriting of history whereby almost America becomes the only true carrier power. Which isn't really the case when you look at the 1920s and 30s. There are, they're all pushing forward carriers in a way which benefits them and suits their own needs. And that's slightly different for each nation, so the carriers produced are different for each nation, because it's context and nuance on a small scale for in between individual nations can produce massive differences in terms of the ships which suit their needs. And the reality of impacts of the treaty system, which I think without the treaty, the, the British and the American carriers would have been far closer in design, because there is a lot of similarity in philosophy. It's just the British focus on our approaching from a more making their carrier more survivable in and of itself, and the Americans are going for a larger air group allows you to hit more, which gives you an increased chance of survival. And it's sort of that's a difference in approach, which is exacerbated by the treaties. Whereas if it hadn't been for the treaty limitations, especially the cumulative limit. 27,000 tons is capable of doing that. It is. Please don't get me wrong. You can do that on 27,000 tons standard. But being able to do that on and do that enough times, produce enough vessels for the needs of Britain or even for America, is incredibly difficult on the treaty cumulative limit that they were provided by, well, the Washington Treaty and the second, uh, the first London Treaty. Second London Treaty doesn't have cumulative tonnage limitations. That's a reality. And so, to an extent, the carrier becomes the symbol of the American global reach. And that's what it was pushed through. And this is what has become, it, just like the Dreadnought and the, the ships of the line, were the symbol of British global reach. In so many regards, respects. Where there is some real truth into the fact that the Americans were pushing into something which no one else was really doing, were really pushing, it's not shipborne carriers. It's not shipborne aircraft carriers. As I said, the British have them. They have lots of them. They have more carriers than the Americans in the 1920s and 30s uh, in numbers of hull vessels, you know, numbers of hulls. 
the Japanese, Imperial Japanese Navy having have them, the French have them. There are others toying with the idea of them and working on them. It's definitely not as much an American centric thing and American centric thing as some of the history does portray it. And in World War Two, of course, they do have the glorious thing of having Coral Sea and Midway, which are pretty much, along with Philippine Sea, are to an extent the sort of epitome of carrier battles and carrier and carrier warfare. And the reality is, for especially the British carrier fleets, they don't have a carrier to have a fight with. So I guess they'd love to have a carrier to have a fight with and show how good a carrier they were, but the Graf Zeppelin never comes out. The Italians never build one. The burn is on our side the whole way through. <laughs> it's, and by the time you have Operation C going on, it is a very close-run thing, as I've said before. It could have turned into a night strike. It could have turned into a very interesting scenario. Because technically, in daytime, the Japanese have the superior uh, superior strength. Definitely, they have the more carriers to a greater air group. They do. But at night time, they, have, they are basically defense little bunny rabbits. Versus the equivalent British being a sniper with an, uh, a, a, someone armed with a high-powered rifle with a... Um, Decent night vision scope. You know that that that's the scenario you're dealing with. Uh, it's a really interesting scenario because, as I said, if it, if they fight during the daytime, the Japanese have the advantage and should probably win it. If they fight during the nighttime, well, if the carrier strikes hit during night, then that the British are going to do it. But the thing is, there is an area where the Americans do take a lead. There is an area, and that's leaving all the, uh, what I've said to one side. There is an area where the Americans take a lead, and that is flying aircraft carriers. And this is a really, really interesting thing to get into. Because if the, it does open up a lot of questions, then I will. Today's question is going to be quite simple, so I will put it right at the beginning here, the question at the end of the, that I'll be asking at the end of the video is, what happens if in World War II the US Navy has continued with this program? If Akron and her sister haven't been, haven't had the accents they have had and have continued to work and have been shown to be viable and useful platforms and they've kept building bigger and better ones. The interesting question is, with helium production, the fact that the Americans have a massive advantage of that with their own, with their ability to produce helium from uh, the dis gas the distillation of natural gas, etc. And if they can continue to do that, that is a tremendous advantage. It's a tremendous issue for, let's say, the British and others to match that capability. So it becomes a really interesting stumbling block for others to go, ooh, can we match this capability? Also, as aircraft grow more powerful and bigger and heavier, does it still work? That's the size of the ca of the character. It's an incredibly interesting thing to think about. The reality of World War II, if these had gone on and been something, and who would have had them, and what would they have had? Because I cannot imagine Hitler, with all the investment he puts into the various Zeppelin airships, not wanting one if it was a viable thing, if the Americans had them. In which case, definitely the various European power, uh, powers are going to have them. Italy's going to have one. Mussolini's... Well, Mussolini's constant desire to compensate for something which must have been remarkably small to require so much compensation... Is never going to stop. Is never going to allow others to have one, and him not. Uh, then you've got France, which will respond to Italy and Germany by having them. Britain will have to figure out a way. Japan certainly that will do so. The whole thing becomes very, very interesting, and changes things because let's be honest: if you have these sorts of capabilities 
going around flying over the North Atlantic, let's say, during at the begin at the beginning of World War Two and during that period, does the escort carrier come to be? Because surely uh, a, 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 a vessel like this, uh, for want of a better place, an aircraft like this, with the ability to d dispatch its own aircraft, would be a suitable anti-submarine warfare deterrent and methodology of doing submarine hunting. It also might change a lot in terms of AA gunnery on ships, because suddenly your larger guns having a long-range capability to engage, I like the first generation of counties, and there is a small possibility that the reason the first generation of counties with their 8-inch guns were able to angle them up to 70 degrees was the idea of a major airship and dealing with that at long range and its potential threat in terms of being a reconnaissance asset against a task for uh, against a mobile surface group well does that continue on does it affect treaty designs do they start do they add these to naval treaties it, it it all it becomes a very intriguing discussion if they survive. It really does. So, with that all said and opened up, Trials, Battles, and Daring's. Now, Trials, Battles, and Daring's, of course, is my first book. It's the only book I've got currently that's in physical publication. It's out on its second edition, which is the paperback edition. And I want to thank everyone who's bought a copy of it. I'm an academic... As you will know, if you're watching this channel, there's a reason my doctor's down there. It's to make it easy for a find for um, my students to track me down on YouTube if they want to come and look at some of these videos as a uh, form of extra study. It's also to differentiate myself from the other Alex Clarks there are on YouTube. There are lots of us. There are lots. I follow most of them, purely because, as a fellow Alex Clark, I should follow you. Whether you have the E or not the E, uh, I will follow, just to see what you're up to and cheerlead for my fellow Alex Clark. There are many of us on YouTube. Seriously, look us up. We're taking over. But, uh, yeah, thank you to everyone who supported me. Because with Academia, the only real way we get judged and promoted and secure posts, etc. is on book, uh, public, book publications and how well we're doing with our books and... Uh, yeah, without your support, I wouldn't be anywhere. So thank you. And thank you for the support to the channel, for those who like, who share, who subscribe, who are patrons, who do Kofi donations, which are always really appreciated because they literally do pay for my Ambro. Um, patron is very much structured towards going for, uh, for, uh, for the books. Uh, YouTube money tends to be divided between books and occasionally things like some travel expenses and takeaways. And Kofi is literally iron brew money, so thank you. Now, without the caffeine and sugar of that, I wouldn't get through all the content I do. And, uh, yeah, so thank you very much for all your support. And, of course, there's, mem uh, let's mention membership in the channel as well. It's all very much appreciated. So, according to United States Navy aircraft since 1911, this, this is what the USS Akron, and I was explain this, the, uh, the USS Macon, as in Bacon, so Macon, were. And it is an interesting review of them. Now, it's a fun thing to read, I have to admit, and it's a really cool book to have. Um, I sort of happen to have it sitting here. It was published in... Well, this particular version is from 1976. The original version was published in 1968. And it's a, it's, a, it's a cool book. It really does provide a lot of information about the development of US naval aircraft. But one of the interesting things you get into when you start looking at their lighter than air fl fleet, especially their rigid lighter than air fleet, and that is what we're talking about. We're, ta we're not talking about the blimps, the inflatables here. We're talking about the, well, the Zeppelins, one of a better phrase, to sort of 
scribe and son off of them. That is appropriate enough where they start. These are the US Navy looking to go big. Looking to capitalize on something they have access to. They have an ability to have which others don't. Because let's be honest, the US has a huge advantage in the production of helium in this time period. They really do. They have advantages in production of other things as well, which really do help them. Now, this does give me a bit of an opportunity to clear up one small point that often comes up. So, you know, uh, should they have supplied helium to Germany for some of their zeppelins uh, in the interwar period? They have a huge advantage in the production of, uh, of helium. They don't they still don't have a lot of it. Helium is actually pretty darn difficult to get hold of. It is pretty darn difficult to create, especially in, or rather, achieve in large quantities. And whilst there are some interesting modern methodologies around, which allow you to get it from other sources, the primary source is still natural gas. It's still the fractional distillation of natural gas, of fossil fuels. That's where we get the vast majority of our helium from. Now I'm going to leave it there because honestly, to go into the process more is a absolute, absolute scientific work. And I would really want a whiteboard and a few other things set up for that. But one of the things you have to think about is that the US Navy got interested in this very, very early. Um, in 1903, it was found that under the American Great Plains, a lot of the natural gas deposits had helium. And eventually, thanks to various people suggesting things, including an English chemist, Sir Richard Freffel, the USN sponsored three experimental helium plants during World War One. Those were designed to supply the barrage balloons. And honestly, by the time you get to the 1920s, the US Navy and the US as a whole has a huge advantage when it comes to production of helium. In fact, up until rather recently, I think it's the 90s, um, when Algeria's production lines came online, the US was 90% of the commercially available stuff. Um, there has been other growth of plants in Qatar, other parts of the world, and still though, America is dominant when it comes to supply of helium. So, you know, if you would like to see Actual airborne aircraft carriers. Maybe someone should start making use of those helium supplies again. For that purposes, rather than commercial purposes. It'd be fun. And it all came about really thanks to the work of the Bureau of Aeronautics and the fact that they also had a naval aircraft factory. These two things allowed the US Navy to do all this. It meant they had the bureaucratic power behind it and they had the other capabilities behind it to produce this. Especially, they had Moffat as their leader. And the Bureau of Aeronautics is an interesting and intriguing organization at the best of times. At the worst of times, it's an intransient mob which gets in the way of a lot of productions. It is a formation of... Great inertia, if not always great depth of thought or great breadth of thought. Truly, I have a lot of respect for them. They worked very hard in this early period, and whilst they do have some interesting periods in the interwar years, you can honestly say that their leaders, for most of the, from their inception until about 1942, Moffat, King, Cook, and Towers, are unimpeachable really. Let's be honest, Moffat will do whatever is necessary to get the funding for naval aviation in the US Navy and frankly he will, that's the only thing he really cares about. 
getting the funding, getting US naval aviation working, getting it sorted. He is a massive supporter. A massive supporter of these kinds of airships. And I would say one of the problems when he dies is that the faction which had been supporting them and pushing them dies with him. He had allowed and in fact encouraged a plethora of factions to form and he'd managed to keep them all working with each other, making the case for their sections without destroying another group under his leadership. King does his best to continue that, but King really doesn't have time for lighter-than-air aircraft. He doesn't see their value. He doesn't see the value in these sorts of airships. And he especially, to my mind, is reacting to the fact that both those big ones have been lost. He sees them as a pointless thing to invest in. That he's just going to sacrifice a load of political capital. I think that causes an issue longer term. I think that causes an issue within the factions warring for control of the Bureau of Aeronautics. I would say, for example, that the dive bomber faction retains an ascendancy longer than necessarily it was justified to by the actual needs of war fighting. I would also say there are some factions in there which get wedded to certain ideas as being beyond discussion. And that is always a scary time. There are various things in history where, in history that historians learn are scary. When someone says this point no longer needs to be discussed, we just need to act on it. Well, you can act on it, yes, but you still need to be discussing it because otherwise you can lose control of it or lose understanding of it very quickly. When someone says, we are sure history, uh, we will sure history is with us, look at most of the people through history who've claimed history will be on their side. They haven't tended to be good or nice people. There are a small number, but they are outweighed by a whole lot of nasty people. If you are certain history will judge you well for no, well for your cause, that can excuse a lot of very nasty actions. It's amazing with humanity. That can be a catch-all for excusing a huge amount of things. And I just this is just for context, because it's all to do with the first one, really, for this discussion. And the third thing which historians tend to worry about is when anyone comes up with a neat causal relationship for anything. X happened, and that created Y. Ad hoc ergo propter hoc. After, therefore, because of. It's a logical fallacy. And it's something that turns up in history so often. So many people go, well, X happened, and then Y happened, so Y happened because X happened. History is very rarely, if ever, so neat. It's in, in the, usually if some if history is being prepared to be this neat and this simple, either someone is selling you a bowl of ship, or someone is covering up a lot of frigging mistakes. They have done something. So always be worried when you're getting a very simplistic approach to history. X, therefore, Y, or something like that. And even when I present it on this channel, when I present, when it does actually happen like that, I usually try, there's usually contextual and nuanced reasons about why it happens that way. There is usually other factors bleeding into it, which makes X a primary factor for leading to Y, but never the only factor for leading to Y. I'd also say, looking at this group of officers, um, when someone starts to produce the idea that uh, certain aircraft were chosen for World War II service because of briberies, well, if you try and bribe Moffat, A, you'll fail, 
but he'll turn that scenario into something which will allow him to use pol do political blackmail on you and everyone who supported you to get whatever he wants. I'm not sure how he'll do it, but that's the way he operates. Uh, y y don't do that. Ca there are places you can play these games, but don't play try and play that game on a master of playing that game, because they will turn their skills on you. The only things which stop him playing that game on a regular basis are budget of the U.S. Navy of the U.S. Navy's Bureau of Aeronautics, and the fact that he doesn't need to do it. He doesn't want to do it himself. It is own code. But if you t try and do it to him, then he's completely happy to do it to you. King permanently angry with everyone, and himself, and everyone. Trying to bribe him is well. I can think of quicker ways to commit suicide, for want of a better phrase. Uh, I, I hope that hasn't upset anyone, but that's virtually what you're doing. If you are trying to bribe someone who's permanently angry, you will be going out that window. You might be lucky and go through the door to out the window, but either way, you're going to get kicked very hard. Cook and Towers? They're not quite as violent in their tendencies, but they are also quite interesting in their tendencies. So, it's it's interesting in that the Bureau of Aeronautics has its own issues, but they're not the same as the Bureau of Ordnance and other bureaus with the US Navy. And I wouldn't say the Bureau of Ordnance is a hotbed of being bribed or anything. It's you, Bureau of Ordnance is a hotbed of, we're sure we're right and we're not going to listen to anyone saying we're wrong. And they have their own issues. And having a naval aircraft factory, well, it gives them an opportunity to build their own airships. And whilst they are assembled in other hangars and facilities around the country where they have spaces big enough to assemble those airships, a lot of their parts and components are actually created in the naval aircraft factory. It's a useful space they have completely under their own control and which they don't have to worry about people adding costs onto it. It's also a useful tool which a lot of these particular commanders of the Bureau of Aeronautics, the leaders of it, really liked because rather like with Royal Dockyards or the US Navy's own um, naval dockyards, the capability to produce their own ships and produce their own aircraft gave them a very good idea of how much it would cost to produce X, Y, or Z. You know, you say, this aircraft is going to cost us this much to build. You you can send the designs down to the factory manager in Philadelphia and go, how much would it cost you to build this aircraft? And they'll come back with a figure. And okay, you have to adjust for slightly differences in technique and, and certain things, but you've now got a ballpark figure. And you can look, is this within acceptable range of that ballpark figure? If it's not, then someone is lying to you. And the odds are, it's not the person at the Naval Aircraft Factory. It's helpful. It truly is. And talking about Admiral Moffat, who is this gentleman in this picture. He is a truly intriguing gentleman. And a truly capable one. I've got a video which I'm going to be playing in a couple of minutes and I'm going to use on this channel because I, I, I know it's a good video to play for you all to sort of watch a bit about the USS Akron and its flight. And it's going to be an interesting part of the video to have up. But he is important. I put a special slide about him in here because... Moffat is critical when it comes to the Lexington class, when it comes to development of so much of the US Navy's aviation capabilities, so much of its doctrine, its planning, its setup. You will hear a lot in histories about Billy Mitchell. Billy Mitchell is a showman who causes himself more trouble than anyone else, shoots himself in the foot and causes more problems for aviation to be adopted and introduced than anything else. The reason he causes trouble is because he treats it as my way or the highway and he doesn't try to persuade people. He presumes they're going to need to they're going to take him as ideas on because they're so brilliant. 
He doesn't actually work to persuade them. And, yeah, when you're looking back post-World War II, post-Cold War, you've seen all the feats and capabilities of aviation today, you can sit there and go, yeah, Billy Mitchell was right. But if you're looking at the aircraft in the 1920s, you're not going to see that. If you want to see someone who successfully works to integrate aviation into his service, into war fighting capability, into an actual viable system, Moffat is far, far in advance of Mitchell. Far, far more capable and far less celebrated. Because Mitchell has this roguish quality which makes for a great movie. Moffat is a diligent, slightly bland, in terms of his public persona, stalwart, who works quietly and efficiently and deals with under-the-table deals with the way that you and I would deal with organising a takeaway and gets it all done and gets what the Navy needs procured, whether the Navy necessarily wants it or not, but they don't argue with him over it. If you want a similar style figure to Moffat, you are really looking at Rickover, Hyman Rickover, who does the same for nuclear submarines and nuclear power in the US Navy. Moffat is that kind of figure, but he is far more powerful than Rickover is ever allowed to be, and you see how powerful Rickover is. But also, he's far more clever with how he uses that power, I would argue, than Rickover. Rickover does all sorts of little abuses of power to as sort of to show his strength and his capabilities. Moffat is never so unsubtle. But he is in post for a very, very long time because of his capabilities. In the tempestuous period of nineteen twenties, he's in post from July twenty sixth of July, nineteen twenty one to the 4th of April 1933 when he dies. That's nearly 12 years. And he's not removed by retirement or political machinations. No, he dies in a airship crash. The Akron. That is true capability. And that is true skill in that scenario. It really is. Anyway. This is the Shenandoah flying over the Potoka. An airship supply tender. And I thought while I'm giving the discussion of the concept. I'm going to start the video. And you're going to have the video playing. Now the video does last a few minutes. But I will be talking over it from behind. So whilst you won't see my face. I will be here. I might pause it at certain points to show you other pictures, but, you know, it's coming. So what was the concept of operations? Well, truly, it's this. You have, at the beginning, the concept was that the airship would do the reconnaissance itself and be the reconnaissance platform itself. And the aircraft would be merely things for providing extra information. Maybe even a little bit of escort for the airship to an extent. And there's a whole there's a discussion, debate about that. As time goes on, this evolves. This really does evolve. Because they start to realise that actually maybe taking your huge floating airbase, which has all your supplies, abilities to uh, rearm your aircraft and refuel your aircraft and all the other things you can do with it, Taking them that close, that close to the enemy, might not be the sensible idea. It might be, and just bear with me here, it might be more sensible to have that hold back. And then the idea becomes, well, basically what the airship will do, it will, uh, it will arrive in some coordinates and hang back, hang far back. And the parasite craft will be deployed out. And they will go and conduct reconnaissance and find the enemy and find what's going on and do the necessary missions. Whilst the airship really takes on a sort of command and control function. 
providing stable long-range communications, sitting as high up in the atmosphere as it can, you know, really providing that base of operations, that mobile base of operations. And it was envisaged this would be multi-day operations. These would be long-range trips. Now, I have to add on, and I, I will add on, that there were, of course, problems with this concept from the beginning in terms of what was actually viable at the time. There is this wonderful scenario where you're looking at the technology, they're, uh, what they're requesting on the technology, what they're requesting on the personnel at the time, and what can they really do. One of the things they can really do, truly do, really truly do, is they can operate and recover aircraft. That's not the same as being able to successfully coordinate with those aircraft. They certainly do are trying it in exercises and certainly are thinking about it. And they, they, they certainly have ideas for how to develop it. But the trouble is, and I think this is the real problem with this as a concept, is these aircraft are lost so quickly that you get really a bare bones concept and there's no time to truly develop it. The other problem, and this was especially a problem for the US Navy at this period, was that these aircraft, airship operations, all the scenarios you have going on, are incredibly skill intensive. They require a lot from the crew. They require a lot from who is available to work it. And the trouble is the US Navy doesn't have necessarily the large pool of personnel to go around it would have in later years. One of the problems we have with discussing the US Navy of this period is that we often, mentally at least, compare it to the US Navy of today. And the US Navy of today does suffer shortages. It doesn't have enough personnel by any stretch of the imagination, especially in some key engineering areas. But what it, it lacks today is nothing compared to what it lacked in this period. When you are rapidly developing whole new areas of naval operations, naval en en engineering that the Navy needs to support, all sorts of new concepts are having to be built. And it's a very slow to grow its personnel numbers, especially its skilled personnel numbers, up through the ranks. It's often you have, especially for the senior positions, a lot of competition for those key people, for those skilled, capable people. And this means, to my mind, that, again, the whole carrier airship or airborne aircraft carrier, it suffers. It suffers from several things. They do, they do have ideas for larger, bigger, bigger aircraft. They do. That would have been intriguing to see in operation. But, again, the problem is that those aircraft, as big and as capable as they would have been, would have still been facing a lot of the problems of the technology of the time period. And one of those key areas of technology, technological problems, I would argue, is weather and being able to actually accurately monitor the weather for large enough distance around you to avoid the accidents that cost the US Navy these aircraft. There are lots of problems with operating an airship. There are lots of difficulties with operating an airship. And, well, <sighs> weather really is a key, a key part of that. I'd also argue that I think in many ways they jumped in, put, they were forced by, they jumped into a situation and were forced by circumstance and context to put all their eggs in two baskets. And that wasn't enough when you're dealing with technology which is this fragile at this point. It's fragile in its, point, in its period of development, it is. They needed more. They didn't need a production run of two, they needed a production run of six or eight to work from. And then if you lo lost a couple, you would still be go growing and developing things. You'd still have the capability. You'd still have enough critical mass to continue. They didn't have that opportunity. One of the reasons they didn't have that opportunity was honestly their own helium production. I mean, in earlier generations of ships, they are honestly 
swapping the helium out of one aircraft to put it in the other aircraft because they don't have enough helium. And we are talking about a nation which has the largest production of helium of anyone in the world. That's the other point when people talk about, you know, they should have given it to Germany for their... They should have allowed Germany to buy their helium. Well, as much as production of helium as they do have, they aren't producing enough for their own needs. They aren't producing enough even for their own needs. They can't supply anyone else. They might be producing the most of anyone in the world. Unless you have a pre-existing contract going through, they're not going to take on new contracts at that time. They just can't afford to. They're not producing enough helium. So let's talk about the construction. Now, the changes over the traditional Zeppelin design are pretty apparent the moment you look at this. A traditional Zeppelin design will usually feature uh, single girder diamond trusses with radial wire bracing. Now, I really need a picture of a Zeppelin to explain that because that sounds weird even just coming off my tongue. Unfortunately, the only decent picture I can find of their constructed frame is of a crashed one. So, <laughs> hopefully that gives you the right impression of the differentials going on here. Because what we see here is, of course, the single girder diamond trusses with radial wire bracing. As you can see, if you look at the way that it's shaped and that the structures are formed. But if you look at the Akron, you'll see that she's using um, what's called at the time self-supporting deep frames. Now, these are triangular Warren trusses curled around to form a ring. You can see the triangle shape and you can see the shape it's producing. And that's an unusual system. That is not how they are normally formed. I quite like it. I think it looks stronger, and it was stronger, but it is also heavier. It makes it less likely for them to suffer um, the in-flight breakup, which earlier U.S. Navy uh, uh, airships had had. Uh, they, they'd lost a couple to do that issue, but definitely heavier. Stronger, certainly, but heavier. Now... They also allowed Carl Amstein, the chief designer, to ignore the traditional cruciform structure used by the Zeppelin to support the fins of the ships. Instead, the fins are cantilevered and mounted exter entirely externally to the main structure. This would, in theory, allow them to be, how do I put this politely, more controllable in theory. In theory, it would allow a more axis of control on those fins. It also enabled them to, instead of going with a supplementary axial keel, which is again the traditional approach of the Zeppelin structure, the Akron could use three keels. One running along the top of the hull, and one on each side, 40 degree, or 5 degrees up from the lower center line. And again, you can see that if you look at this picture. You can see those 45 degree ones. And that, what that means is you've got a 90 degrees between your key, your lower keels, 90 degree space, and then you have 135 degrees up around to the upper keel. So it, in a way, what do I say? You know, in a way, it sort of turns the traditional Zeppelin manufacturer on its head with its straling. and. Each keel, especially uh, of course these low ones, provided a, a walking, a run, a walkway, which ran, a, a sort of space which ran along the entire length of the aircraft. Now the electrics, telephone wiring, control cables, 110 fuel tanks, 44 water ballast tanks, eight engine rooms, the engines of course themselves, the transmissions, and water recovery devices were all placed along the lower keels. So the lower keels are incredibly important to the structural strength of the aircraft. The inert helium, being used of course instead of hydrogen, which is the other option, um, meant that you could actually place the engines inside the hull and the generator room with two Westinghouse uh, DC generators powered by a 30 horsepower internal combustion engine which was positioned forward on the number 7 engine room. So you have the engines actually inside 
inside the airship, which allows you to maintain them in flight, allows you to organize them, and allows you to, again, keep that engine going. Now, the thing is, they then have a shaft system, which allows them to power the propeller, which was a two-bladed fixed-pitch propeller, outside of the aircraft. So the engine's inside, mounted in their own little sort of engine rooms, and there was literally eight of those, and the propeller's outside. Has a shaft assembly to, uh, to, to take the power out. Now, the most interesting thing to me is that while Germany, France, Britain, pretty much everyone else building these sort of things, tended to use um, gold beater's skin to gas proof their gas bergs. And gold beater, that's an interesting material. It's a very long term traditional material. It's been used as an early form of condoms, it's been used as all sorts of things. And it is um, the and I'm going to use the technical phraseology here, the processed outer membrane of the intestine of an animal, typically cattle, occasionally tried horses, not as good. And basically what they did was they used um, layers of that interleaved with sheets of gold, and the whole point was to produce a very thick composite scenario, kind of like plywood in some way, which was both very, very uh, durable, with a high strength to weight ratio, and more importantly, very good at retaining things. Um, they were, how do I put this politely, or rather in a way which isn't going to cause other people to go, I can't believe you used that word on me. Um, they were used often when you required very strong tensile material in the world before we developed a lot of modern plastics and a lot of the modern fabrics we use for certain for certain things. It's a it's a good way of maintaining a seal, and they're fairly strong and fairly durable. But instead, the Americans went, "Oh no, we don't want to touch that. Oh, that 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 just sounds bad. No, no, no. Um, we, what we're going to use is uh, Goodyear tie and rubber have produced a rubberized cotton. It's heavier." But it's cheaper, we consider it more durable, and um, it doesn't make us feel dirty to touch it. It doesn't make us feel dirty to touch it. Also, we prefer gold in Fort Knox. We don't want it around our gas bags. So, half of the gas cells uh, used this, and... Half the gas cells used uh, an experimental cotton-based fabric, which was impregnated with a gelatin latex compound, which was brand new. Uh, that was even more expensive, though, than the rubberized cotton, but it was even lighter than the gold beater skin. And it was so successful that her sister ship, the Mekon, was made, uh, uh, all her gas bags were made from that. So basically, the Americans were very picky about what sort of what materials they were using, and they were very keen on making these these ships as capable as they could be, these aircraft as capable as they could be. I do find it funny though that apparently the um, the gas cells were numbered zero to XI in Roman numerals. Of course, forgetting that Romans didn't have the zero. That was Arabic. So, um, it should have been I to XII for the 12, but no, they had the zero. So, some was trying to be very, I don't know, posh, status-seeking. I, I have no idea what you can say, but they, they did it, and they did it in a way which would make everyone who actually did know the subject look down on them. It's just terrible. It's terrible. Why just not just number it? Uh, number it 0 to 11 or 1 to 12 in normal numbers. But no, you want to use Roman numerals? That's fine. Then get the Roman numerals right or you just look an idiot. Crew, 60. Length, 785 feet. Diameter, 132 feet, 11 inches. So that's 239 meters by 40 meters. 
Height, 146.5 feet, or 44.7 meters. So, definitely not a perfect sphere going on. Volume, 6.5 million cubic feet. Gross weight, 403,000 pounds. That's 182,798 kilograms, or roughly 183 tons. Useful lift, 182,000 pounds, or 83 tons, pretty much. Power plant, as I said, 8 Maybachs, uh, VL2, 60 degrees. V12 water-cooled engines, producing 560 horsepower each. Useful. Gave her an overall theoretical capacity. Remember, this is a theoretical capacity of 4,480 horsepower. Propellers, two-bladed, fixed-pitched, rotable, uh, rotatable wooden propellers. So you could put them forward, could put them back, and all sorts of positions could they could be achieved. Maximum speed, 73 knots. That's not bad. Cruising speed, 43 knots. Range, 9,190 nautical miles at uh, 43 knots. Which is good, as long as you're not heading into 20 knot headwind, or a 25 knot, or a 40 knot headwind, because then you'll be making, doing 9,190 miles at 3 knots. Or rather, you will not be doing 9,190 nautical miles. It's the same with ships. Guns, 8.3 caliber machine guns. Aircraft, five Curtis F9C Parahawk, uh, Sparrowhawks or Consolidated N2Ys or uh, Waco XJW1. They actually never carried the full capacity of five. Um, some managed to make it to four. Akron, she has this designer space of five and then when they get up there they realize they put a beam in the wrong place and so they can't actually use two of the spots to hold it and make on... Uh, never gets to full five. Also, if they're carrying the larger aircraft, the Consolidated N2Y1 or the Waco XJW1 versus the F9C, they take up more space. It's just like with any hangar on any carrier. You have your maximum capacity of aircraft is when you're carrying your smallest aircraft. The moment you're carrying an aircraft which is bigger and can do more jobs, it's going to take up more space. That's the secret of why air groups change. And why you can look at a carrier and go, wow, that carrier has a really small group, air group, and that carrier has a really big air group. And then you look at the hangar size and go, their hangar size is the same. Why is their, aircraft, why is their air group number different? Oh, yeah, that's got um, 60 single-seat fighters. And that's got 36 three-seat strike aircraft. Ah, yes. That explains it all. It's the joy of history. So here is the other half of the equation, and this is really what gives them their maximum capability. The Curtis F9C Sparrowhawk, and honestly, this little gorgeous aircraft is what makes a lot of it possible. Why so interesting? Well, think about it. From a balanced perspective, these aircraft have to do not the same kind of operation as you have to do to land on a carrier. Let's be honest, one of the troubles with them is originally they are built in carrier landing configuration. So they can land on an aircraft carrier. Which, believe it or not, requires a significantly more robust airframe than being scooped out of the sky or landing on the Earth itself. In fact, this interesting system and could have paved the way to developing some really cool aircraft because this would probably be the least structurally straining method of recovery of an aircraft you could have. Think about it. The trapeze is lowered through, the, uh, through a T-shaped door in the bottom of the aircraft, i.e. the airship, into the slipstream. With the airplane attached to the crossbar by the skyhook above its top wing, the pilot's on board, the engine's running, the pilot trips the hook, the airplane falls away from the aircraft, uh, from the airship. 
And then when they return, position uh, the pilot positions themselves beneath the trapeze, climbs up until they could fly the sky hook onto the crossbar, at which point it automatically latch, uh, latches shut. And with the engine set to idle but not turned off, the trapeze and airplane were raised in the hangar. The pilot cuts the engine as they pass through the door. Once inside, the airplane's transferred from the trapeze to a trolley, running on an overhead monorail system. And from that, it's then shunted into one of four corners of the hangar to be refueled and rearmed. And you could also store an aircraft on the trapeze itself. Now, they realized immediately, though, that only having one trapeze raised to some problems. It limited the rate at which air aircraft could be launched and recovered. And if there was any fault, the trapeze would leave any airborne scouts with nowhere to land. So, what did they do? Well, they kept the idea of a second, fixed tra trapeze, permanently rigged further aft along the bottom of the ship at station 102.5. It was known as the Perch. It was fitted in 1933. They planned three more Perches. Uh, 57.5, 80 and 147.5, but they were never fitted. So the idea was you'd have four perches on the outside. Just in it so the aircraft didn't have to run out of fuel, it was a problem the trapeze while they're fixing the trapeze. Also, in theory, of course, though, that means you could almost run an alert system and you could maintain some aircraft out, especially if you've managed to put in some sort of system of getting the pilot, uh, getting the pilots in and out of those aircraft in those positions, eventually as you developed it. Or, of course, alternatively, you could build a airship large enough that would have had two active trapezes, as well as maybe four or, five, or, four or six perches, and could have had double the hangar space. Maybe even more. Maybe you could... Connect. The sensible thing would be to have it so that the trapeze is... It was kind of be a lustrous style carrier arrangement with a trapeze either end of the hangar and a hangar space set up so that you could... Again, folding wings might be really useful in this scenario because if you could perch the aircraft internally off the side with their wings folded, but still do maintenance on them maybe, and have a central bit where they could run through with their wings spread so they could go to either trapeze... And then you could launch them. And if you had perches below, just in case there was problems, you could also use the perches for keeping your, let's say, your cap ready to go or anything, your alert fighters. Oh, we have enemy aircraft closing. Oh, good. Disconnect. Fly off. Alert fighters ready to go. Maybe launch some more after them. You'd need a very big airship to make that work. And... I would say, before people start going, well, you know, we could do this today. Today, there's an even bigger problem with that, okay? Today, there is these things called missiles. There are these things called satellites. All the scenarios where an airship had an advantage in the 1930s, 1940s, no longer really apply. But the really interesting thing is those advantages could have applied in the 1940s. They could have done. It could have been useful. It would not have replaced the proper carrier. There are... I'm sure at least one person will consider that as an option. But you are never going to get sufficiently large air group. But I do not see you, why you couldn't get a scenario where you could have an air group of 12 to maybe even 16 aircraft. Especially if they're the smaller Sparrowhawk type. It's interesting. Now, she was launched, this shows her importance, by Lou Henry Hoover, who's the first lady of the United States, and probably the best shot to end up in the White House at this point since Teddy Roosevelt. And I'm thinking through the occupants of the White House from then to today. Eisenhower was a good soldier, but not always the best shot. Kennedy was really not good with uh, good with accuracy when it came to guns, according to the reports and discussions I've read about him. Um, C 
Carter is interesting, but he was a nuclear engineer, not a marksman. And I don't think, I, whilst he, whilst definitely a passionate. Whilst I do think he did some hunting and things like that, I don't think he was... No, I think probably she's the best shot. Um, since Teddy... Ru uh, I think it's probably between her and Teddy Roosevelt over who was the best shot who's ever ended up in the White House. Because uh, she was... friggin' scary. According to even her husband. So, an interesting and ca very capable lady. And she's who launches the Akron. And to me, that shows the importance of it, because think about this. This uh, this ship, this aircraft, uh, this aircraft, this airship, so many different words I can use to describe it, it's being launched by the First Lady of the United States. In terms of imagery for the U.S. Navy to present, there is no one more powerful more state uh, with greater status who they can put there in a traditional position to be launching a ship and to get the first lady to turn up and launch a ship well yeah they were they, they were slightly less in demand in those days than they are necessarily today and slightly less political figures than they are today but they were still pretty much in demand and it was not an easy task it was going to require political capital. It was going to require interest, and those are not things you expend for no reason. You know, Admiral Moffat is not going to waste the uh, waste the favors he would have to call in to get this to be put through if he doesn't think it matters and he doesn't think it's worth it. And let's be honest: the First Lady of the United States herself will not turn up unless she thinks it's worth it. So her maiden voyage in the January 1932 exercise. The maiden voyage was, well, it went fairly well actually. She, you know, on the 2nd of November 1931, she cro uh, took a cruise down the eastern seaboard to Washington D.C., uh, from where she'd been assembled. On the 3rd of November, she carried 207 passengers. This was both to prove that in an emergency, airships could provide high-speed airlift of troops to outlying possessions, but also because, frankly, taking a whole load of people up and showing them, how, look how cool it is, does help with selling it to the taxpayers, or more importantly, to the politicians who are directing the taxpayers' funds. And that's something she's going to be used a lot for in her life, doing a lot of work like that. In fact, the... Video shown earlier comes from 1932 when she was operating over the Chesapeake Bay area. So that's not long after she's into service. In January 1932, she advanced, uh, She departed to work with the scouting fleet on a search exercise. Um, she proceeded to the coast of North Carolina, then headed out over the Atlantic, where she was assigned to find a group of destroyers that were bound for Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. Once the plan was, once those destroyers were located, the airship was to shadow them, report their movements, and hopefully, therefore, provide enough information to allow for an intercept. Basically, like Admiral Beatty was supposed to do at Jutland for Admiral Jellicoe, but couldn't. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. I know, I know, there's no reason to bring it into this, but I couldn't resist. Um, leaving the coast of North Carolina at. 0721 hours on the 10th of January. She proceeded south, but unfortunately, bad weather prevented her sighting the destroyers. Although the destroyers themselves sighted her at 1240 hours Eastern Standard Time. Eventually, she. The phrase is usually used is shaped, so sort of did a sort of windy course in the direction of Bahamas in the afternoon. And heading northwestly into the night, she changed course before midnight and proceeded to the southeast. At 0908 hours, roughly, give or take a couple of minutes, on 11th of January, she spotted the USS Raleigh, the light cruiser. It helps when you do this, of course, she's an Omaha-class light cruiser. And she was in company with 12 destroyers. 
She positively identified them on the eastern horizon two minutes later, and then sighted a second group of destroyers shortly thereafter. This helps. This allowed that she you know, spotted them. At 10 hundred hours, she's released from the evaluation, having achieved what was considered a qualified success. And I do want to point out there's an important phraseology here, because what does qualified success mean? Well, I think the phrase qualified can come up to a lot of understand misunderstanding. I um, hear a lot of discussions about qualified immunity and qualified this and that, and it's when something is qualified, what it means is, under certain criteria, the under certain criteria, this can be considered so. If this is some whatever it is you are saying after that one has to be has to fulfil certain criteria to be the case. So, if something's a qualified, if you've got qualified immunity, that long means you have immunity maybe from prosecution or something. For under certain circumstances, if you do, if what happens doesn't fit in those circumstances, you do not have immunity. If it's a qualified success, it's considered success under certain circumstances. The, the scenario was, you don't have aircraft aboard; you are literally just using the airship itself. Can you find them? Can you actually do the very basic minimum? Can you find? Can you identify them? They achieved that. So, is it a realistic wartime assessment of her in her role? No. But it's the kind of test which you do, because if they can't even achieve that, then there's no point doing any further tests. That's the whole point of saying it's a qualified success. Again, there's just some interesting discussions about that going, well, this means she wasn't a capable aircraft. No, that doesn't mean that. What it means is... This is not a full-up test of what we would expect in wartime capabilities, and this is not a full-up test of what we expect of her capabilities to be. This is a baseline test to assess whether she can actually do the very basic task that underpins all the other ones we're going to ask her to do. And there are various quotes which sort of then try and make that the other way. There are some who try and say this was remarkable, this was amazing they had flown so far they had done so great and again it's not remarkable it's not amazing it, 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 try you have to compare the apples with apples and oranges with oranges um, comparing it to a heavier than aircraft and going oh, it could fly so far and stay out for so long and no 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 heavier than air aircraft no no plane could do match this is does not really help She's achieved a qualified success. It's neither amazing, because it was expected of her to achieve that, but it's also not a bad thing. It's not saying she's a bad air, a bad airship or not capable, because that wasn't what was being tested. It's a qualified success. And so, that's a good thing for her exercise. Now, I'd like to now bring you into something else. She was going to be a, a multi-aircraft style vessel. Not quite like the Langley. She wasn't going to be operating pigeons. At least I don't think at any point they're planning to operate pigeons from her. But she was going to have this. The spy basket. The idea was they would drop this through the cloud layer. The, ship would, uh, the airship would remain above the clouds. This would drop through the clouds. And the person in it would then be able to spy on the enemy fleets below. It's a very interesting idea. There's one small, tiny issue. Just, just a small, tiny issue of it. When they first tested it with sandbags, it oscillated so violently that it put the ship in danger. And by oscillating, what I mean is the basket proved so unstable that it was swooping from side to side of the airship, reaching apparently as high as the airship's equator, so actually going up higher than their own command space. So the officers inside were watching as this thing was going up 
and going up. Now, it was improved later by adding a, a stabilizing fin, but for some reason, it was never used again. Admittedly, if her career had gone on longer, perhaps they would have done, but honestly, I, I, I don't think um, myself, and I, I would consider myself a fairly brave individual in some ways. I, I, I do like climbing, I, I do like abseiling, I do like diving, all sorts of quite interesting activities. They're all fun to do. I don't think you could pay me enough money. I don't think, honestly, you could incentivize me with anything in any way, shape, or form to get into that. Especially not after seeing it doing his oscillation and just going from side to side. There is, there is no way I would get into what is a bomb-shaped sarcophagus which is going to go on a rock and roll ride. There is no freaking way. So, I can understand why it wasn't tested. They did apparently test it on uh, Macon. Again, they did. They tested it on Macon, but... Um, you'd have to be a lot braver than me to get into it. A lot braver. And, yes. It's an, it's an idea, but no... <laughs> Now, the flying aircraft carrier stuff was actually rather useful, and this starts to accelerate quite quickly, and it's, as this works out, I start to realize that maybe, maybe this is far more sensible than deploying things like the spy basket, or searching for things itself as an airship, using the aircraft. And here you can see a consolidated N2Y launching from the trapeze between and beneath the Akron. As you can see, the trapeze comes down quite far, It's a really sort of cool bit of kit. Now, when they carried the N2Y trainer, they could carry two of them. That would max out. So, they could carry three of the Curtis Sparrowhawks, but they couldn't go to the full five because, well, as mentioned, the hangar had a small issue. It had a beam across it. Which meant they couldn't get to two of the positions. Still, Lieutenant D. Ward Harrigan and Lieutenant Howard L. Young managed to mm, carry out some historic landings, carry out the first attempts on getting in the aircraft, and proved the concept very quickly. And so they got did so well that they even did a demonstration flight with members from the House Committee of Naval Affairs on board, and those same pilots gave lawmakers an actual demonstration of the aircraft hook on ability and were showing it off to them. So they not only did it well, they did it well enough that Moffat and the rest of the US Navy was happy enough to put this in front of the politicians' faces. That's good. That's, that's doing well. That's doing really well. But all this had not been achieved without some incidents. Uh, the first accident had prevented her taking part in Fleet Problem 13. Um, pretty much what happened to her was that on 22nd February 1932, while she was being taken from her hangar, the Akron's tail came loose from her moorings, was caught by the wind, and struck the ground. Now... At this point, this is where during the live I got into trouble because I hadn't, I had forgotten that I have a significant number of railway and train aficionados and lovers, like, and to extent like myself, although I have to say mining engines have never been a particular of mine, in my li who like to watch my lives, because as a result of this accident. Well, the tail came loose and struck the ground. It's damaged. It means that she can't operate S until April that year. That's that's taken her out of service for over a month. And when she does go back into service again, she takes up Rear Admiral Moffat and the Secretary of Navy uh, Adams themselves, and they go in for a fly nurse to show she's okay and show their faith in her. But they also build a turntable with a walking beam on tracks, powered by electric mine locomotives. 
and this was developed to secure the trail and uh, the tail and turn the ship in even in high winds so that it would be pulled into the um, hangar at Lakehurst where they were based without damage. Now, powered by electric mine locomotives, this really intrigued me. But I hadn't done the research when I did the live because, well. I hadn't thought to. I hadn't thought that anyone would be interested enough that it would become a major topic. And I was asked questions, and I was going from, well, from a little bit I've read, I think it's this, but now I know. And I know thanks to, if I can make this disappear for a second, and disappear, the Walking Bean Docks a Giant Airship, article from Popular Science, April 1932. Yes, I had to go hunting. I had to go hunting to find this. I had to go fun to, uh, because I found lots of books which mentioned this, and they didn't tell me anything about it. They were all going, this is a walking beam system news, and I'm going, yes, great, so explain the walking beam system, explain the railways. Didn't find it, so I did something naughty. I went to the Wikipedia article, and I found there, yes, they mention it, and they give a link to an article which talks about it. Okay, let's see if someone else has found this for me, and someone had, so I'm not sure who is the person who found and actually referenced this, but honestly, I, I, I firmly believe that all the books I've read about it literally have probably just gone to the Wikipedia article and gone, I can't reference that, so I'm just putting this in, and haven't bothered to click where their citation was. I don't know, though, I can't prove that. It's just my suspicion for the fact that none of them have gone into more detail than it has a walking beam, a walking beam system, which is power, which has nine locomotive engines supporting it. And, well, that doesn't explain much. But it's a really cool article, and... I want to give you the full article, but I also realise that I can't, the, script, the way the article is shaped, I cannot make it cover the full screen, and you see it all. So, some of the graphic is going to disappear first, as I'm going... Uh, I'm actually, yes, some of the graphic is going to disappear first, and then I'm going to scroll down to the graphic, and then I'm going to read the article for you, so you'll hear about this as well with me. So, up we go. Now... Really help if I could keep my finger straight. I don't know. And it's a pretty darn cool uh, thing. And it's a very clever idea the Americans had. Honestly, it really is. So let's put it about here, because that really shows off what we're talking about. Now, it takes only 90 men now to dock the biggest ship in the world, the giant Navy dirigible Akron, in her Lakehurst, New Jersey hangar. An innovation in mooring methods practiced there, centering around a massive docking beam invented by Lieutenant C.M. Bolster, U.S. Navy, has aroused the interest of airship experts the world over. The new method eliminates the gravest danger an airship can face, the risk that a sudden side gust of wind may smash it against the hangar doorway while it is passed through. So securely held is the Akron that she cannot break loose even in a 25-mile wind. Hither, hither, hitherto, it has been considered unsafe to dock an airship of such size when their wind exceeded 8 miles an hour. Steps in a docking operation are shown above. As soon as the airship's nose is secured to the mast on the field, a low-hung mine locomotive scoots beneath the tail, towing the 186-foot docking beam. With the tail of the ship made fast by mooring lines and a coupler, it may be pushed around against the wind until the ship faces the hangar. Then a second locomotive tows mast and the airship's inside, the beam acting as a carriage on the rollers. To launch the airship, the procedure is reversed. During either procedure, as the massive docking beam moves so freely upon its anti-friction rollers that the airship is able to transmit the mass pushing or pulling forces through its own frame without excessive strain, according to naval experts. Now, this is really cool. I, ha I will say this. this is, it's a really cool system. One of the interesting things is, I don't, I don't know if you've noticed this, is that when I was first talking about it, and what certainly came up in many of the books, etc., when talking about this, was that there were multiple mine electric, uh, mine electric locomotives involved. 
And the thing is, one of the examples actually says there's four or five locomotives they have as part of the system. But you're only listed as needing two to actually carry this out. Now, that intrigued me. I have to admit, that did intrigue me. The idea that you only need two to carry it out. So, multiple would mean to me that you can the system's designed to deal with multiple aircraft at the same time. Which makes sense, and is, from military and operational perspective, act absolutely sensible and absolutely logical scenario you want to go for. But, it is interesting. Because... You also probably need some locomotives in case one isn't working. That would make sense. So how many do you think you need? Well, this is where the discussions get interesting, because some said there's nine mine locomotives secured, which to my mind would be enough to operate three systems and give you, because that was, you need six, two for each system, and you also then would have three spare. Theoretically, that's four systems, but let's be honest, this is 1930, 1920s, 30s technology. Um, add in a healthy dosage of, oh, frigate, that's gone wrong. That's not working. Or that got busted. Or someone had a bright idea. It's all a sort of really interesting system. And it seems to work quite well. Also say, say, when it comes to the mine locomotives, that we are probably talking about a 2 foot 11 inch, and maybe 7 sixteenths, it's roughly 900 mils, um, gauge. So very, very narrow. I would add that I'm fairly certain from the type and shaping of these ships, uh, these locomotives, I have now too many systems of that these are of the uh, these are not only of the electric type. I think they're the battery electric type because I don't think they would have the overhead electric type. So I think they're going with what was at the time still some of the latest and greatest technology for mining, and this would have been a significant investment to make this work. But still, I found it a pretty cool system to look into, and. Once I did find this article, I could then go and find a lot of other information about it by going looking at various pieces. So, thank you. And, yeah, this is a point I will make in this video and in many others whenever I discuss Wikipedia. You can't, as an academic, use Wikipedia as a source. The reason you can't use a source is there isn't a single author responsible for ensuring that it is accurate. So, there's no one you can hold accountable for the accuracy of that. Lots of people can edit it, and some people edit in good faith. In fact, the vast majority do, and the vast majority upload in good faith. But you can't track, and it only takes one ba one person who decides they're going to have a bit of fun or decide to be a bad actor, and you've got problems. But, in my experience, whenever I have gone to Wikipedia articles as a search source and gone down to the sources and the references, very quickly you can tell from the source and references whether it's a well-written article, but also you can use those sources and articles yourself if you can't find resources your, uh, resources to make an adequate assessment yourself. So for an ex in this case, I couldn't find a book which went into significant detail or sufficient detail. But Wikipedia had a link to this article. I found this article. It's really cool in Popular Science magazine. And from that, I've been able to extrapolate a lot of information out and go hunting through various other sources to collate in. So, yeah, I enjoyed it. No, slightly sort of off topic, but I thought you'd, if I might find it, it's also a bit interesting. And then we have the other accident. This was in the coast to coast flight. And, well, sadly, what happened in this accident, this is what's pictured, they suddenly became lighter. Um, they started their evaluation, all their settings up and getting ready to leave. And the helium gas gets warmed up by sunlight. It, as it gets warmer, it gets more active, more energetic, and it starts to take up more space and become less, even less dense, which of course affects the weight. 
and when it added to the fact by that they'd already used quite a lot of fuel in their transcontinental trip at this point already. They had lift being increased, and they were already underweight. You can guess what happens next. The mooring cables cut, but whilst most of the mooring crewmen actually managed to get safe, one let go at 15 foot, suffered a broken arm, but survived. Three others were carried further aloft. Of these, uh, aviation carpenter's mate Fur Class, and I'm going to get this right, so I'm reading from my notes, Robert H. Edsel, and apprentice seaman Nigel M. Henton plunged to the deaths. They weren't able to secure themselves properly. It just, it's the way life happens sometimes. But apprentice seaman C.M. Bud Cowart held on to his line, secured himself to it, and then was hoisted on board the airship an hour later. Akron managed to then moor at Camp Kimi later that day, um, and then proceeded to Sunnyvale, California afterwards. Footage was actually appeared in a film called Encounters with Disaster, released in 1979. But it's the danger of operating these things. And again, what's interesting is, this is the problem when you're taking these things against away from their main base. Because if you consider, at their main base, they have this. This system. That's not going to be a problem at this system. It's not, because you have so many things there to secure it. And so much other weight there to hold it down. And it's it's not, the people are not going to be in the same level of risk. But the moment you move from your main operating base to a base which doesn't have the same infrastructure, you have an issue. And this is one of the issue, one of the problems you consistently have with aircraft, even lo especially long range aircraft, is that the aircraft can look give you an extremely wide radius of operation, but it's not necessarily as wide as it might seem at the first at the first look, because you can go, well, we can operate this far from any base. Can you operate this far safely from any base? Do you have are those bases designed to support it? One of the interesting conversations we have with modern aircraft, especially the ones which have stealth and other systems, uh, other things which require a lot of intensive maintenance and a lot of capabilities to ensure they're kept in tip-top condition, is do you want to go to the expense of putting that level of infrastructure in every base you might need it from, or are you going to save money and just put in the ones you think you're going to use it from? Because that's going to be a far shorter list, but it's also going to limit your options. And anything you do which limits your options... Me it makes it easy to task for your opponent to eliminate you. And that's actually where aircraft carriers come in, because you can build the infrastructure into them, and they have the advantage they can move, unlike, uh, unlike an airfield, which can be have its location Googled. But there again, aircraft carriers are, of course, in themselves, a very, very attractive target, which is why you make them part of a task group, so that they all work together and all work in symbiosis and actually provide an overall force, and... Then you're into a whole combined arms approach to warfare scenario where hopefully everything is uh, the combination is greater than the sum of the parts, and that's the actual competition is between the sum of the parts, and that's off today's topic. Part of the, the year's topic, but off today's topic. At this point, she finds herself on the west coast of the United States, and she literally spends her time showing the flag. Now, I have to say, this is a picture of her above Lower Manhattan. And let's be honest, that is not the west coast of the United States. That's the east coast. But I couldn't find a decent picture of her. Soaring high, looking beautiful, from the, her west coast trip. I couldn't. However, she had fun while doing this. Um, she took part in exercises while on the West Coast, uh, serving as part of what was called Green Force. She attempted to locate White Force, and despite Vought two Corsair float planes from the enemy warships trying to oppose her, she located the enemy forces within 22 hours and managed to avoid being intercepted. 
However, however, not there for long before, well, she needed more repairs. Maintenance, repairs, facilities, all things which you don't have elsewhere, you only have at Lakehurst. And I have to say, this is ultimately the big problem for the United States airship program. They don't have enough of them, and they don't, certainly don't have enough infrastructure. If you really wanted to have a bi-coastal system, if you really wanted to have the ability to operate them all around the country and over both oceans, you needed at least three, if not four or five, air bases. And that could sustain them, and probably six or seven with a couple in the centre of the country to act as infrastructure hubs. And the idea would be you'd have them operating from all of those. So you'd have the two in the centre of the country operating as training centres where crews go and get trained and also major refits and maintenance is carried out. And then you'd have your active centres where you have three or four ships based, airships based at, on the edges of the, on the coastal regions. But that would require an investment of roughly 28 to 30 something um, ships. Uh, airships and they never got funding for more than two. Uh, operating two at a time was the limit really. So there is a difference between what was a very experimental analysis of the capability versus what the operational version of the capability would probably have had to look like. There really is. Especially as that number would be enough to sustain operations even if you did suffer losses due to storms and those sort of things because the sad thing about operating all equipment in the, in the scenarios where militaries, navies have to operate equipment is there is always a level of attrition of the equipment. Sometimes in exercises, you are preparing for war, you are training for war. War is not a safe activity. And the exercises sometimes will be more unsafe than you hoped they would be. You'll do your best to mitigate them and make it safe within reason, uh, within the reasonable abilities to provide an accurate training experience and an analytical experience for your personnel, but you're still pushing the envelope and doing very dangerous things in as safe a way as possible, and sometimes your mitigations won't work. She took part in a lot of exercises, and she was constantly in use. This is one of the interesting things about Akron and Macon. They were both constantly in use and were useful. They, they did their best to avoid unfavorable weather. Um, for example, when returning to Lakehurst, uh, she departed Sunnyvale on the 11th of June 1932, but because of the weather, she had to fly at pressure height while crossing the mountains, which made her far lower than she preferred to be in crossing the mountains. She then, as I said, was, went back for repairs, but then she took part in the search for the Curlew, a lot, yacht which had failed to reach its, the end of its race in Bermuda. It was found safe and sound off Nantucket. And she then carried on exercising with the trapeze equipment, Admiral Yoff Moffat himself actually not only boarded uh, on the 20th of July for a flight, but he left her on the 21st of July by N2Y, by aircraft. And that took him back to Lakehurst. The idea was that a severe storm was delaying the airship's own return to base. They were avoiding the storm. So get him back on time, go in the N2Y, get back inside the site. And that's another option which you could consider for these ships, these airships, really. They could be floating command posts. You can imagine Admiral Nimitz commanding World War II from a, a giant airship, all his staff running around, able to move in, watch his admirals when he needed to, and get out of the area when he needed to. It would have been target numero uno, as would Yamato's, uh, Yamato's have been, but uh, it would have been interesting to see. She just carried on being used. And being useful. The trouble is, then, in 1932, she ha August 1932, she has another accident. Um, her tail fin was fouled by a beam in Lakehurst's own hangar. In the very hangar she was supposed to be safe, her, her tail fin became fouled. And this was done after a premature order to commence towing the ship out of the mooring circle. This is the trouble. You have machines, you give orders, 
the person will act on them, and it's, it's just it's just not always sensible. And this caused issues, but they did rapid repairs, and then they carried out eight more flights in 1932 over the Atlantic, and they were mostly working again on the trapeze, the F9C2s, and trying to carry out drills for the lookouts and gun crews. And one of the interesting things I'm still not quite sure is where the guns were. I have to admit, I've looked at many, many discussions, and none of them seem to agree where the guns were positioned. So if you are absolutely sure and actually have an article or some design pointing out where the gunnery positions were, and I'm presuming the reserve control position and the forward control position would have had some of the guns in them, but I'm not sure if there were any mounted actually along the ship. And I, I do notice these two port looking like things it would interest me now I would also add that one of the things I didn't discuss earlier when I was talking about her construction but which you can see really well in this picture is she's got some water recovery positions above the engines now that's supposed to help her with two things one maintaining a water supply board but two stopping her losing weight so much by dropping fuel and the idea was if you don't have to drop, if you don't have to start expelling helium because you're still taking on weight because of water as ballast and you're capturing water over your engines, that's a good thing because it means you don't have to use up expensive helium. You can still have the helium to reuse for other occasions. If you have to get rid of the helium to, let's say, lose, uh, lose lift, get capacity because you're going too high and you haven't got enough weight to keep you down, that's expensive to replace. Helium matters. And honestly, this system was designed to preserve helium, but also to help with her own survival, survivability, really. Now, after that, she returned to the fleet. And... Her commander gets relieved, um, Captain Commander Dressel, who's been her commanding officer for quite a while, uh, is sent off to become the first commanding officer of the Macon. Sensible, you take someone who's experienced commanding the elder sister to go be the first commander of the new sister, so that they know, they know what they're doing. And Akron herself is taken over by Commander Frank C. McCord. Who well, actually gets a Fletcher class destroyer named for him in World War II? Now, he has quite an active career before she goes down. He manages to take Akron to be part of the uh, 4th of March 1933 um, swearing in of Franklin D. Ro Roosevelt as the his President of the United States. So she overflies Washington, D.C. And he then takes her down to Panama on 11th of March. And they get back to Lakehurst on roughly the 22nd of March. On the 3rd of April, sadly enough, things change a bit. She casts off the mooring mast to operate um, along the coast of New England. She's basically assisting in calibration of radio direction fighting stations. She has Admiral Moffat aboard again, along with his aide, Commander Henry Barton Cecil. And also, um, Commander Fred T. Berry, who was the commanding officer of Naval Air Station Lakehurst, was along as well. And a gentleman who's called Lieutenant Colonel Alfred F. Mosry. Technically also U.S. Army Reserve, but he's not there in his army guise. He's there as the Vice President of Mack Trucks, who was a strong supporter of the idea of civilian uses of rigid airships, which was an important thing for the U.S. Navy, because... They had no hope of getting up to that 30-ish airship group if there wasn't a, a thriving civilian industry also alongside it to bear some of the cost. This is not the age we have with nuclear submarines and nuclear power plants where budgets are big enough and secure enough that navies can afford to go right and we are going to basically bear this cost ourselves. Because whilst, yes, there is a nuclear industry, there are nuclear reactors which are civilian powered in many nations. Australia is an interesting example, considering what they want to currently do. The reality is, there is enough differences between the reactors you put on a submarine, and even the reactors you put on a surface ship, let alone the reactors and the reactors on land, that 
it is going to be very expensive for navies to maintain those skill sets. So you want to try and have as much of a civilian base to draw from in terms of to reduce costs where you can because, again, the more industry, the more potential suppliers, the more ability there is to actually get reduced costs. It's when you have single source suppliers that are privately owned and charging uh, a profit, uh, that's called a monopoly and that's very, very bad. And unfortunately, then, now, all the time in between, governments do find themselves when they're pushing certain, uh, certain technology envelopes at, beholden to monopolies because there's literally only one who's invested, invested in the equipment to provide that. And so they can charge whatever they want because it's whatever the market will bear. And if you need it for the armed forces, often the politicians, because of political ramifications and the fact they are spending taxpayers' money, are prepared to spend it. But saying that, Moffat realizes this is not a sustainable practice long term, so he's doing everything he can to get civilian involvement and civilian participation in the industry. Now, she cast off at 1928 hours, and she encountered fog and then severe weather. She actually passed over Bangor Light, uh, New Jersey, at roughly 2200 hours. Sadly enough, they didn't realize they were flying into what is probably one of the most violent storms sweeping across the North Atlantic in within a 10-year period. There is arguments that at certain points it might have been within a 100-year period, and it would soon envelop them. This is strange to me, but it's due to the realities of weather, and, uh, weather uh, prediction and weather technology at the time to actually understand what was going on. They should really not have been out. They should really not have been going out into this level of storm. Especially not in the way they were doing. They were enveloped in fog. Lightning was getting heavier. The rain was getting heavier. And it was becoming extremely turbulent by 0015 hours on the 4th of April. Now, at this point, the question you probably should be asking is why have they been heading into this for over four hours? Why at no point did they say, right then, let's turn back? In pass from the storm, they've put Moffat on a aircraft and have launched him to the base, but they haven't. And the reason I think they're not, they're not doing so is there's three things at play here. You have... A fairly recently promoted commanding officer who's trying to show off his ship to a civilian guest and to his admiral and to his command. I don't put any blame on him, though, for this summer circumstance, but the fact is there's also an admiral aboard who is trying to show off, and everyone's trying to push the envelope and see what they can do, because also there is an environment they want to try and operate in as wide a variety of weathers as they can, because that's going to represent the best value for money and the best capability. So what they think might be capable versus what it is capable. And I don't think they necessarily realize how bad a situation they're getting themselves into. Again, this is where information about weather becomes critically important. There is a reason why meteorological personnel become increasingly important in navies as aviation goes up. If you consider in the age of sail, if you turn around and go, we have a meteorological officer, they'd look to you as if you were insane, going, Why? When it's windy, we have power. When it's not windy, well, we have a make and mend day. Once you're operating aircraft, weather becomes incredibly important. Where is the cloud uh, cloud layer going to be? Uh, what is the sort of the conditions going to be for aircraft in terms of their taking off? Where's the wind direction? All these things become very very important. Aircraft carriers. Often one of the most important sections in an aircraft carrier is actually the meteorological office. Because it matters. Because this information matters. And with airships it matters even more. But this is the trouble. We're talking very much at the beginning. The nascent stages of naval aviation development. Of aviation development. And 
yeah, it just hadn't been a factor, really. Anyway. At this point, at roughly 0015 hours, on the 4th of April, 1933, the Akron suddenly found herself in a nose-down descent. She was dropping. She reached... 1100 feet uh, while still falling. She'd started being at cruising altitude and she'd basically just dumped down. They dumped ballast and they managed to stabilize the ship finally at roughly 700 feet and climb back fairly quickly to a 1600 foot cruising altitude. They'd earlier been on a far higher cruising altitude. They get up to 1600 feet quite quickly. And then almost immediately, they get hit by a second violent descent, which pushes her downwards at what's estimated to be somewhere in the region of 14 feet per second. The sh airship descends tail down, though. The lower fin strikes the sea. Water enters the fin, and the stern's dragged under. The engines are doing their best to try and get the aircraft airborne, but what they're actually doing instead is putting it into the nose high altitude, attitude, and then it stalls and crashes into the sea and breaks up. It's disaster. It truly is. At this point, there is a question what happened? Well, if we consider a storm front, especially once you get closer to the eye of the storm and those sort of scenarios, you get areas of high pressure, low pressure, etc. An airship can be incredibly prone to those. I would, myself, think potentially they found that they managed to go, they managed to hit the eye of the storm or roughly that area. And that's where they gained altitude. Because, to me, if the storm's coming in a constant direction, and especially if they're going into it, they suddenly lose altitude. Go down. And they pull themselves up. And so they're through. Whatever up, uh, and they're up. And then, because of what's happening at the altitude they are, they get caught again, and they go down. That makes sense, considering how quickly they're losing height, but I can't say. Honestly, we don't have enough information to really know. This is entirely supposition based on my part, based on some estimations I've done, looking at the maps, looking at the weather reports, and charting together with the history I know. And it's important to admit that. There are lots of reports, there are lots of theories. My view is the answer to this all lies into the fact that the meteorological teams, their information, etc., had not yet been as integrated with the command process as it needed to be. That they were still learning to get that information in. No single person is therefore at fault. And that's sometimes a difficult thing to say because it's far nicer, far more easy to blame someone, to have someone to blame and point to. And you could maybe go, well, Moffat, he's the admiral in charge of the Bureau of Aeronautics. He's in charge of all this. Why hasn't he? It's, you should never blame people for not knowing what we know now. The fact is, the, uh, the inclusion of meteorological officers and their increasing role within staff and planning of aviation operations is something which grows in the 1930s. It grows in the 1930s dramatically. They'd already started to be around in the 1920s, but they grow dramatically in their importance and their viability in the 1930s. If we consider another example, and I will use this example because I'm more familiar with this one than I am with the exact history in the US Navy, but whilst the Royal Navy had a meteorological office, as it was known from about 1854, providing the Royal Navy with daily weather forecasts, those were shipping forecasts. Um, its first formal meteorological course didn't come into existence until 1912. And... Honestly, they started to grow and include and have to 
work out what information you needed for aircraft, for operation, air operations, from 1912 onwards. And we're looking at something which is 20 years later, but let's be honest, 20 years is not a long time when you're developing all these things. And what the, you know, the big thing for the Royal Navy had been its own airships, and it's the same for the US Navy. But bringing it together, bringing it all up and working it through, that took time. That took a lot of effort and a lot of development. And the Royal Navy, the, uh, the official Na UK Meteorological Office is basically, it's part of, part of its creation is because of the Royal Navy supporting it. But there is a difference between the Royal Navy and the US Navy in terms of their political support and instrument and infrastructure and institutional knowledge and memory when it comes to getting what they want through government. So this is another problem the US Navy is suffering at this point. Trying to implement these things always on a shoestring budget. Again, if you if the Bureau of Aeronautics had more money, it had more airships, probably possibly they might have had a meteorological team assigned specifically to them, to each base, to provide them with the required data they needed in time to do these operations. And it's not a daily operation, a daily update you need. You need something which is up to date for the last few minutes, last hours. How are storms diverted? What's a prediction of the what storm's going to do? All these require a lot more people and a lot more skills. Just saying what's happening, what, uh, in, in, but actually making a prediction, that's a tough thing. Knowing how high to maybe fly to try and avoid the storm. All these are useful information. She crashed into the sea at 0023 hours. Roughly. And we know this because of the merchant ship pictured, the uh, Phobos, which was a German merchant vessel. Now, again, think about that in terms of timeline. They first had their nose down the scent roughly 0015 hours, and within eight minutes. They have crashed into the ocean. So within eight minute period, they have lost height from cruising altitude. They're at to 1,100 feet, regained to 1,600 feet, and then have dropped. Oh well, not you know. Um, actually, they went down to as low as 700 feet, and then they stabilize. You know, they they're reaching. They're still falling 1,100 feet, and they don't stabilize till they're 700 feet, and then they get back to 1,600 feet. They're sort of cruising at that altitude, and then they're going down again. There's no time for the crew to really do anything, is there? It just isn't. Eight minutes sounds like a long time, but in a time when you're going through that kind of roller coaster. They managed to pull the executive officer, Lieutenant Commander Herbert V. Wiley, aboard at 0055 hours. And they picked up three more men. Chief Raiderman Robert W. Copeland, Boatswain's mate, second class Richard E. Deal, and Aviation Mel Smith, second class Moody E. Irwin. Copeland sadly never regained consciousness, uh, consciousness despite artificial respiration being provided to him. And the German sailors did spot some other men in the water. They did not know their ship had chanced upon the crash of the Akron until Wiley regained consciousness roughly at 0125, 0130 hours. They then did their best to comb the oceans for a further five hours. They stayed there till pretty much 0700 hours. And they even got the help of uh, a USN blimp, the uh, J3. And there were various other vessels. The first US Coast Guard cutter, the vessel, first US American vessel on the scene, the Tucker, arrived at 0600 hours. And they took the survivors and the body of Copeland aboard and let the merchant ship get on its way. But the merchant ship tarried, carrying on to try and do its search. It, as I said, it was there till pretty much 0700 hours. And it was doing its best. They would, The crew did a very good job trying their best to search for survivors. But at that point, there was very unlikely to be any survivors. They sent in the USS Portland, the destroyer the coal... 
Um, some Coast Guard destroyers, the McDougal and Hunt. Some co more Coast Guard aircraft and the other Coast Guard cutter, the Moave. There's also a fishing vessel, the Grace F, which assisted research using her signing gear to try and recover bodies. They decided the most casualties had been caused by drowning and hypothermia. The crew hadn't been issued with life jackets. There had been not been time to deploy the life raft, and it left 73 dead, including Moffat and all those special guests who'd been aboard. So, was she worth it? Yes. Honestly, yes, and they needed more of them. And I'm quite happy to say that. This cannot replace an aircraft carrier, and honestly, you're probably still going to need cruisers for quite a lot of reconnaissance roles. But having some of these around in the Battle Atlantic, in the Battle, uh, in the Battle of the Pacific, would have been a useful asset to have. I'm not sure whether they, you could use them for resupplying island fortified island bases, but you could certainly use them for getting some personnel out there, which would have been quite helpful. But you can also use seaplanes, a lot of things like the Spruce Goose for that sort of job. Although, let's be honest, the Spruce Goose never really got off the water that much, so probably not her. But that's the idea. You could use those for those sort of roles. What could you use an airship for in this role? Well... A reconnaissance asset and an interim warfare asset is a pretty darn useful thing. If you can send one of these out to a patch of ocean, have aircraft wandering around, spotting for enemy act activities, reporting back, especially pre the satellite era, that's that's an asset. Think about it this way: think about the raid on Tokyo and some of the other carrier raids done in 1942. Imagine if the U.S. Navy had been able to deploy three or four of these in advance of the raids to spot the area help the fleet get through if they were high flying enough that you know with a pressurized enough cabin etc that no japanese fighters could reach them they could just drop their aircraft down aircraft go do their wandering around and they disappear and you know the area is clear you can run your ships through at high speed or Hang on, no, there are trawlers, a line of trawlers in this area. Ding, ding, ding. Watch out for them. Have a plan for dealing with it. Yeah, you can also do that if you're operating a decent reconnaissance screen from the carry itself, but this could operate beyond the range of that screen. So yeah, I, I think it would have been useful, and I think they were a useful idea. I just... As is usual with the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Armed Forces in the pre-World War One era and even the 1920s and 30s, they're just not investing enough. They've got technologies which could have been really useful and really useful in World War Two, but there again, if they had them in World War Two, others would have them in World War Two, and that's that's where things get really interesting. That's where things get really interesting. The really, really interesting thing is that I'm fairly certain the U.S. would not have supplied all all powers with helium. And, as said, they have the vast majority to supply. Now, the British might be able to find a decent source of helium somewhere in the Empire. Might be able to. There are a couple of places I think they could go and looked. But... That's it. Quite a lot of the other scenario, other major powers, they're not going to be able to get it domestically themselves. Maybe they'll have a little bit, but will they have enough to create multiple airships? The US, with all its production and all its capabilities, could manage to maintain two airships at a time. Sometimes one airship, with them sharing the helium. And that was with all sorts of systems designed to try and allow you to retain as much healing as possible. So, you don't have the option of, do you use hydrogen? Hydrogen airships have obvious problems and can make for very big bangs if attacked in the correct way. So, yeah, 
it would be an interesting scenario to see what would have happened if they had pushed ahead. Losing both the Akron and the Macon, that basically destroyed the idea. It meant there wasn't enough data to justify it, and no more was really pushed. And it was con it was made even worse by Roosevelt pushing his decision through that they would be limited and couldn't build airships of sufficient size to do that role. He was very much in favour of heavier than air aircraft. But also, I think to an extent, you needed someone like Moffat with the level of political connections he had to push this through. If it was going to happen. And he, of course, dies. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. And what have we got next week? Uh, we've got the French Naval Aircraft Squadron System. And the book still hasn't arrived, but it will be done. With or without the new edition of the book. It'll just be the old edition of the book, and I hope it's still as correct as the new edition. <laughs> thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed, and take care. Ba -da -da -da. Let's just keep going off center. Who knows? Oh, I need to buy some iron brew. I really do. I've run out. I've got brew ships tomorrow. Uh, I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. <laughs>